Dear congregation of the Lord, which is the most tyrannical regime that you know? Some of you might maybe think of Nazi Germany, others about the Soviet Union, and still others about the Chinese Communist Party. Yes, all those regimes have killed or caused the death of tens of millions of people. But did you think about the Egypt of the Pharaoh? The, the Egypt, please, of the Exodus? That Egypt was at least as wicked as the modern genocidal regimes that you know. The pharaohs of that time embarked on a project of extermination of the church. If that plan had succeeded, they would have sealed the eternal doom of the entire human race from that time forward. Because the messianic line would have been cut off, we would have not had Jesus Christ to come and save us. Fortunately, our Heavenly Father came to his people's rescue. And he used the genocidal plans of Pharaoh to bless the church. So my assignment this morning is to proclaim to you the gospel of the triune God from this spirit-inspired historical account of how God blessed his people through persecution in Egypt. The theme summarizing this gospel proclamation is this. Yahweh uses persecution to bless the church in Egypt. Under this theme, we will see three points. First, we have the origins of the persecution. Then, the intensity of the persecution. And finally, God's blessing through the persecution. Yahweh uses persecution to bless the church in Egypt. The origin of the persecution, the intensity of the persecution, and God's blessing through the persecution. Our text starts with a now, which marks a new section in the history of God's people. A new era was starting. Changes were going to happen. Here, the change was for the worse, unfortunately. We read that the new king did not know Joseph. What does it mean that he did not know Joseph? It does not mean that the new king did not have an intellectual knowledge of Joseph the Great. Why was Joseph so great? Because he was the savior of Egypt, who gave much power and prestige to the, to the office of Pharaoh when he saved Egypt from famine. No, this new king, this new Pharaoh, did not want to acknowledge the blessings that God had brought to Egypt through Joseph. Whereas the previous administration had treated the Israelites hospitably because of Joseph, the new king had a wicked eye toward Joseph and his people. The new Pharaoh was ungrateful. He was not only ungrateful, but he was also anxious. Why was he anxious? Because the Israelites' population growth was miraculous. In the book of Genesis, some other neighbors of the patriarchs even tried to join themselves to the patriarchs in order to share their blessings by becoming one people, by mixing with them. But this Pharaoh wanted none of that mixing. He had another cunning and wicked plan. He wanted to control the Israelite population, to exploit them at low cost. 
And you should know that certainly people of God back then, just like today, were dynamic and productive. And most probably, they had become an important part of the Egyptian economy. Pharaoh lusted after their wealth and productivity, but he hated them. He wanted to have a cheap labor force that could never rebel. So the plan that he found was what? To enslave them. But how did he realize his plan? You can imagine him sitting with his, forenia, uh, with his advisors, please. And he says, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. In Hebrew, the way Pharaoh refers to the Israelites is already subtly pejorative. He could have said the sons of Israel, but he said the people of the sons of Israel. In fact, he was saying something like those Gentiles, those foreigners, they are going too fast. In verse 10, Pharaoh gives his plan of action. He says, let us deal shrewdly with these foreigners. So this Pharaoh, he's very cunning. He does not speak explicitly about his intentions. But everyone understands what he means when he says, let them multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. His advisor understands that he means, see guys, this is a lifetime opportunity for us. If we do not do anything, those foreigners will soon take our place. But we, if we are wise, if we are shrewd, we can benefit from them. We can make them work hard for Egypt so that we ourselves become more powerful. And in that way, we also decrease the population and reach two goals, two births, please, with one stone. What do you think? And you can imagine all the greedy and lustful hearts of his advisors and underlings saying, hmm, yes, this is a great plan. Let's do it. But there is much irony in this account of Pharaoh's machinations. First, Pharaoh fears that if Israel, if the Israelites become powerful enough, they will seek to leave Egypt. If they leave, they will cause Egypt to lose a good part of its productivity and wealth. But he does not realize that making life hard for them is what will crystallize the desire to leave the land. He does not also realize that by oppressing, by enslaving them, he will prompt the Heavenly Father to intervene, to set them free. Pharaoh means it for evil, but God means it for good. Just like Pharaoh, the devil and his allies, meaning our flesh and the system of this world, they seek to tyrannize us through sins, temptations, and suffering. And the goal of that tyranny is to compel us to abandon God. But while they mean to destroy us through temptation, God means to save through testing. So maybe you are suffering currently. You are going through sickness or temptations or any other kind of stress. But you should know with great certitude that our Heavenly Father is working through this, these difficulties that you are facing to confirm your faith and to make you yearn more for Christ's return. Another irony is that 
When Pharaoh bent his mind to think about what is good for Egypt, he thought about destroying God's people. But when Joseph, in the past, bent his mind to think about what is good for Egypt, he saved multitude and made Pharaoh the owner of almost all the lands of Egypt. So, what a crude and ungratefulness from this present Pharaoh. He's portraying fallen man. Fallen man is ungrateful to the core. And people manifested such ungratefulness even toward the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Think with me. The creator of the entire universe accepted the humiliation of the incarnation because he wanted to come and save his people. And he came about his people, please, in the midst of his people. He did no evil at all. He did only good. He healed the sick. He healed the blind. He even raised people from the dead. But what did he receive at the end? Crucifixion. People shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Think also about the current situation of the church here in Canada. Without the true Christian church and all her benefits, Canada would have been a frozen, uninviting wasteland. But today, the government and the people and those who do not believe God point their fingers at God and they accuse Christians of being the backward, hateful, begotten people who prevent others from experiencing paradise on earth as if paradise is possible in enmity to God. But there is another irony, a last one, in this part of the text. Pharaoh and his advisors think that they are wise. Maybe for the short-sighted perspective of fallen men, they are wise. But from the divine perspective, they are very stupid. Like many God-haters today, Pharaoh does not realize that more people means more glory to God and more wealth. If you have a question about that, you can ask me after the service, and I will explain to you. He also fails Pharaoh to realize that he's entering into a heavy boxing match against an invincible, an invincible foe, El Shaddai, the Almighty himself. How can you contend against him? The Almighty says, be fruitful and multiply, but Pharaoh says, be fruitless, die, decrease. The Almighty says, messianic redemption of the church for my glory. Pharaoh says, damnation of the messianic line. Who is going to win? God, the invincible champion, or puny Pharaoh, the devil's henchman? Of course, God will win. He always does. But let us dwell a bit more on this opposition between God and Pharaoh. This contest started in the Garden of Eden between God and the devil, between the seed of the woman and the dragon that we had in Revelation 12. It repeatedly appears in the scriptures because there is a natural enmity between Christ and the devil. The devil's main goal has always been to prevent the coming of Christ by exterminating the church. Remember, for example, in the desert, when Amalek pounced upon the people of God, they saw that the people were tired and wearied, and they attacked them mercilessly to exterminate them. Or remember also in the times of Esther, when Haman wanted to exterminate the entire church. In all those instances, the dragon was trying to eat the seed of the woman. 
the devils, the devil, please, hates us simply because of who we are, the rest of the offspring of the woman, as we read, the body of Christ. Now he can no longer persecute Christ because Christ is ascended to heaven, but he wants to use the world and our flesh to avenge himself on us, just as we read in Revelation 12. There we have read that after the child was taken to heaven, what did the devil do? He made war on the woman and the rest of her seed. Such a war manifests itself in several ways, even nowadays. For example, it manifests itself through the cult of death. Why? Because the people do not want the church to multiply. So they will encourage us to abort our children. They will, they will mock us when we have large family because they say, oh, they want to save the planet. But they do not understand that less people is not what will save the planet, but a more numerous and Christ-exalting church will. So, with this, we reach the end of our first point. What did we see? We saw that the church's enslavement came from the ungratefulness, xenophobia, and greediness of Pharaoh. Xenophobia, Pharaoh, the hatred for foreigners. Pharaoh didn't like foreigners. Then we saw that behind Pharaoh was the devil. Finally, we saw that the Pharaoh's hatred toward God's people was a manifestation of the devil's hatred toward Christ and the church. Now, let us focus on the intensity of Pharaoh's hatred. How intense was it? That will be the object of our second point. The intensity of the persecution. How intense was the persecution? Let us see. We read in verse 11, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. So greedy Pharaoh and his advisors decide to persecute and suddenly, most of the Egyptians are on board with it. How did they carry out the persecution? The text says that they appointed taskmasters over the people of God. So almost overnight, the people of God who were previously free now had slave drivers over them. The goal was to humiliate and make the lives of people bitter with continuous back-breaking jobs. Imagine the situation with me for a while. Maybe many who were physically weak among God's people died, and some who were strong had their health ruined. Husbands were separated from their wives. And people no longer had enough time to care for their own businesses. And as a result, what happened? Extreme poverty among God's people was rampant. There is a sad irony here. Pharaoh was draining the sweat and the blood of God's people to build Egypt's infrastructures. And some of those infrastructures, some of those tall cities that they built were also military fortresses. So we see that Pharaoh compelled God's people to provide him with the supplies and the army he needed to enslave them. The goal of Pharaoh was not only to break the backs of people, but also to break their spirit and drive away from them any hope of freedom. Unfortunately for Pharaoh, the violent persecution 
did not have its effect. The more the Egyptians persecuted God's people, the more God's people increased. Not only did they increase, but our text says that they spread abroad, meaning that they started becoming numerous even in outside of Goshen, the initial region. And so you can imagine that this extraordinary spreading alarmed the Egyptians. Their anxiety was to the roof. And the Egyptian population that supported, that had supported the persecution, panicked when they realized that it was not reaching the expected goal. But what did they do? Instead of stopping and repenting, the Egyptians just hated God's people even more and increased their violence, the violence of their persecution. So they became as ruthless and as violent as possible toward God's people. The Egyptians assigned them particularly to the process of brick making. And even today, despite the technological advances that we know, brick making from clay is still an extremely demanding job. Imagine God's people in Egypt making bricks. They had to prepare the clay, lift heavy loads of brick, and endure the heat of the sun, the heat of the kiln. To have a visual of what I am saying, please, this week, you can try to find a documentary on brick making in Pakistan and India, and you will understand more how the people of God were suffering. So God's people had to do grueling jobs with many beatings and little food. So the church situation was dire. God's people needed him to do something. And you should know, God detests those who treat his image bearers in this way. Even when those people are pharaohs, despite all their powers and uh, authority. Christ has bought us body and soul, both in life and in death, with his precious blood. We belong to Christ alone. We are not Pharaoh's slave. What Pharaoh was doing was an accursed, blatant usurpation of authority. In acting that way, Pharaoh and the Egyptians were imitating their father, the devil. Satan is the father of all those who are sub or subvert the authority of Christ over the church. All governments or authority structures which want the church to worship in a manner contrary to God's word or which want to take the authority of the church in their own hands set themselves on the path of Pharaoh, the path of the Antichrist, the path of the devil. As church, we must resist such usurpation because we belong to Christ alone. We cannot have two masters. Either we serve Christ or we serve the devil. All opposition to the lordship of Christ alone is therefore what? Diabolical. Such opposition can only result in another slavery, a mortal one, slavery to the devil. So be certain. If you refuse to be a slave of Christ, you will be a slave of the devil. There is no middle ground. But let us not fool ourselves. The devil's slavery does not always manifest itself violently with gruesome exploitation and back-breaking labor. The devil can also bind us in golden chains, such as entertainment, prosperity, great ease of life, and all the cravings and addictions that come with it. 
in brief, anything that turns us away from the true worship of God can be an instrument of the devil to enslave us. So, how intense was the persecution? How intense was the hatred of Pharaoh? It was extremely cruel. Pharaoh wanted to break the spirit of God's people. But the persecution did not achieve its goal. Why did it not achieve its goal? The answer is the object of our third point. God's blessing in the persecution. Why did Pharaoh's persecution fail? It failed because of God's blessing. Let us read together verse 12. Verse 12. You can follow with me. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. So notice the parallelism between the persecution's intensity and the church's growth. God was growing the Israelite population to the extent of the persecution. More persecution meant more people. Notice also the echoes of the fruitful and multiply from Genesis in the word multiply and spread abroad of our 12th verse. But to understand more, let us read also Genesis 28 verse 14, please. I should have warned you before. Genesis 28 verse 14. So I read, Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Here, this is God speaking to Jacob, repeating to him, the patriarchal promises, the, promise, the promises that he made to Abraham and also to Isaac. Notice, notice, please, spread to the east and to the north, to the south, to the west. It means your offspring will spread everywhere. We engulf the entire earth. And notice also the word, the expression, the same expression that we read in verse 12, spread abroad. And so with this, we realize that God was fulfilling the messianic patriarchal promises that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he was working to bring forth the Messiah, the seed of the woman. And he could not allow anyone, be he the mightiest man on earth, or Satan himself, God could not allow him to stop his plans. So God was intervening supernaturally to bring forth the Messiah and bless his church. Pharaoh did not incorporate God's reaction in his plan. Let's face it, Pharaoh was not stupid. Intellectually speaking, the plan was good enough to cause a progressive decrease in God's people, separating families, making people work to death, making life bitter. All those things in normal circumstances, if God does not intervene, decrease populations. But here, God, the Almighty, could not allow Pharaoh to challenge his plan successfully. So for the glory of his name and to honor the promises he made in Genesis 28, 14 that we just read, God blessed his church. 
and multiply them. God's blessing does not mean that the situation was pleasant for the Israelites. It was difficult. You could not have found an Israelite saying, oh, this slavery is very good because God is multiplying us. No, you could not have heard that. But any Israelite who had the eyes of faith would have seen that there is hope that God will not allow the Egyptian to extinguish his people, to extinguish the hope of a Messiah and of a promised land. What do we see in redemptive history? Over and over again, we see God increasing his church through persecution. Do you remember what happened in the book of Acts after Pentecost? The church started growing. And then the Jewish religious establishment decided to persecute the church. And in doing so, they dispersed the people. And so those persecuted Christians fled everywhere. And while fleeing, they started evangelizing. And what was the result? The church started mushrooming everywhere outside of Judea and Jerusalem. And the Great Commission was reaching even a higher level. Remember also what happened in Europe and even here after the Reformation. After the Reformation, Protestants in general were persecuted in Europe. And so they had to flee. And many of them fled and came to the New World, North America. And as a result, for many decades, the church in North America was the most vibrant worldwide. Most importantly, this pattern that we see happened at the cross. What happened at the cross? At the cross, the rulers of this world and the devil thought that they were winning. They thought that they were winning by killing the Lord of glory. But to their great dismay, at the cross itself, Christ was triumphing over them, humiliating them publicly, and canceling the ordinance of condemnation that stood against us. Hallelujah! Is that not glorious? God is truly glorious. So, what do you take from this? You should know for sure that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. God is neither sleeping nor slumbering. He looks from heaven and laughs to scorn those who plot evil against his people. There is a splendid future for God's people. So remember this truth when you meditate on the church's future. Remember it also when you suffer for Christ's sake, when people hate you and seek to destroy you simply because you're a Christian. When your flesh, the devil, and the system of this world tempt you, and even when you are sick simply because you are still living in this present Egypt, remember that the same God we use persecutions to bless his people in Egypt. We use your sufferings to strengthen your faith and to make you more heavenly minded, to give you a greater hope, just as it is written. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. And again, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Amen.